Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So I'm going to talk about something that I'm not holding and that's because I don't have one but I'm also going to talk about that. So what am I holding? Well as you know from a previous video this is an Indo-Persian um, horseman's axe essentially. Okay so it's a heavy almost mace-like axe for hanging from the saddle bow of a warhorse war and smacking people predominantly in armour really hard. Um, and very effective weapon it is for that purpose. But if we go back a few centuries, in fact roughly about eight centuries, we get to the Viking era. Now, now I know era, era. I know that all of you love Vikings, and um, you know what is well, what is a Viking? Blah blah blah. Well, you know all that. Okay, we're not going to talk about Vikings in this video. But there was a particular type of um, troop that was used in Anglo-Saxon England called the Housecarls. Now the Housecarls, or Huskarls, as it probably originally more closely pronounced, um, are essentially household bodyguards. Now, a common, I won't say misconception, but a common belief about the Housecarls or Huskarls is that they were always equipped with a two-handed axe. Now there is some evidence in fact that Husqvars or houseguard, ha household bodyguards did not always have these two-handed axes. It is my belief in fact that um, some of the housecarls actually um, didn't necessarily have axes and probably had spear and shield, the normal combination of the period, but I'm not going to go into that too much because it's a topic there isn't, there isn't a lot of source material we can actually debate this over. So. I'm not worried about that too much. But what I really want to talk about are their axes. Now we definitely know that in the 10 hundreds, particularly in England, but obviously in Scandinavia as well, and probably perhaps uh, in Frisia and perhaps Normandy, there was a fashion for starting to use large two-handed axes. Now, first of all, why might people be using two-handed axes at that time? Well, I think there's a number of reasons involved. Um, if we look at the Bayer Tapestry, which um, Lloyd, Lindy Bay, she's done a fantastic video on recently. If you haven't watched that yet, I suggest you go and watch it. Um, but something we can definitely glean from the Bayer Tapestry is that two, and, and in fact the texts as well, not just the tapestry, but the texts related to the Battle of Hastings, is that the two-handed axe was a fearsome weapon against cavalry. Now, in the Norman era, what the Normans were famous for, of course, was their use of cavalry. Not only cavalry, and we shouldn't um, sort of obsess on the cavalry too much, because they did, of course, use archers, cavalry, and um, infantry as well, hand-to-hand -hand combat infantry. And so they were a quite rounded force. And really, frankly, if we, frankly, I like that, uh, frankly, if we look at um, Viking and Anglo, Viking, Scandinavian and Anglo-Saxon um, armies of the period, we could argue that actually they weren't very rounded. They were still fighting in a shield wall. They weren't probably using any cavalry. If they used archers, it wasn't in any great numbers or in any great coordinated tactical way. So by and large, the Anglo-Saxons, um, probably like their Germanic ancestors, um, and uh, indeed like the Scandinavians, had a pr they were pretty much what I would call a one-trick pony. Um, uh, and so in other words, they had they developed a very good shield wall system, probably with mixed missile weapons mixed into the shield wall, a few archers, a few people throwing ang uh, angons or javelin spears of other kinds, um, perhaps some thrown axes, perhaps some thrown maces. We see a thrown mace on the bear tapestry. Um, but in the 11th century, this new troop type comes along using great big two-handed axes. Now, the reason I'm not holding one of those two-handed axes is I don't own one, but it is something that I really want. Now, this is where I'm going to um, diverge slightly from the main topic and say, if you are watching this video and you are able to make a good replica of a um, Viking, late Viking era, Battle of Hastings era, two-handed axe, and I'll detail what I consider a good one in a minute, please get in contact with me because I am actually interested in obtaining one. Um, and of course, anything that, you know, if I find someone who is able to make what I'm looking for, then of course your product will um, get good product placement and exposure and be shown on this channel. Um, so hopefully, you know, it will be uh, mutually beneficial. Um, but um, 
So primarily what I'm looking for is a so-called Dane axe. Okay, so I'm going to address the term, I've avoided it so far in this video, the term Dane axe. So in modern usage, and they don't look like this incidentally, I'm just holding an axe because it was the first axe that came to hand. Um, the Dane axe is a weapon that is referred to a lot in modern sources. Now, historically, I don't believe there's any historical period source which refers to a Dane axe. There may possibly be a reference somewhere that talks about a Danish axe, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's talking about a large two-handed axe. Now, what's different about a so-called Dane axe or housecarl axe, what's different about that compared to other axes? Well, there are a few things which are very specific about the axe, but overall, and this is, the, this is why I found it very hard to find anyone who can make me a replica, they're really light, okay? So hopefully while I'm talking here, you will be getting some visuals from the Museum of London. Now, we have various so-called Dane axes or, or late Viking era two-handed axes surviving from different places, okay? There's some in Sc Scandinavia, there's some in different parts of Britain. But in my view, the most important find of these weapons are these, um, these few axes that we have in the Museum of London. Now the reason why they're so important is because they come from one context. Okay, there's my word, my favourite word. Um, now they come from one context, almost certainly an attack on uh, one of the bridges over the Thames, perhaps the original um, wooden London Bridge, by, um, by Vikings, um, by Viking raiders, I think we can call them Vikings, definitely, who were attacking London. Now, of course, Scandinavian, Scandinavians in this period were attacking lots of parts of Britain, but they did attack London many, many times. Uh, they took London um, at various points, and they failed to take London at various points. Now, the reason that the context of these axes in the Museum of London is so interesting is because they all come together. So first of all, you have an assemblage of axes and spearheads, swords, and a grappling hook and various other things. You have an assemblage of weapons which come together, which are related. That is, they date to the same period and they come probably from the same group of people. I suppose you could argue that theoretically, some of them could be from the English and some of them could be from the, the Vikings who were probably Danes for the most part. Um, you could argue that, but I think given the proximity that they were all found to each other, it's more likely that a bunch of guys went over overboard or a ship got rolled over or uh, perhaps sank, I don't know, or got fire on it and people had to jump off, this type of thing. And for some reason, I suspect that most of those weapons that have been found in that grouping are probably from either one side or the other. And I would say at this date, probably from the Danes rather than the English. Now, one thing we should mention at that point is the English or Anglo-Saxon uh, Anglo house cars, which incidentally later on when we get the Varangian Guard in the Byzantine Empire, we know for a fact that some of the Varangian Guard, the original Varangian Guard were made up of Vikings, Viking mercenaries. But in the 11th century, after the Battle of Hastings, and I believe possibly before it as well, we know that English Anglo-Saxons went and joined the Varangian Guard. So it's interesting you have a cultural link there. And one of the reasons for this is because the house cars themselves were a leftover from the reign of King Canute. Now, King Canute conquered England um, and he brought with him lots of Danishness, essentially. Lots of bacon and Lego and no. Um, so, but one of the things he brought with him that was Danish was the house cars. Now the house cars wielding these big two-handed axes were a Danish institution. But after um, uh, Canute and his sons had died off and we returned to English kings, Edward the Confessor, they kept this Danish institution. They kept the house cars. But the house cars that we see on the Bayer Tapestry, whilst they are almost certainly most of them Englishmen, they are Anglo-Saxons, they are themselves a Danish institution. So I, I suppose you could, if you want to look at a later period, you could look at something like um, the King's German Legion or something like this, you know, that we get essentially a foreign king, the foreign king brings in a foreign establishment and the foreign king dies off or gets replaced, but the foreign establishment stays, okay, it stays part of the English, in this case, English military. 
So the house cars are very, very interesting and there's so much more that could be said about them. I might do a dedicated video about them one day uh, when I know more myself, um, but it is, a, it is a topic which you could get very in depth about, uh, depth about, but I really want to focus on these axes. So these axes were of a probably a Danish or should we say Scandinavian type. They were brought to England and then they established themselves in England such that by the time that William uh, the Bastard or William of Normandy invaded, um, the two-handed Danish style axe had become an English two-handed axe. It had become very much an English institution. Um, but, and again, this comes back to why I have found it difficult to um, commission someone to make one. I did actually commission someone to make one of these axes for me. And after a few months, he concluded that he couldn't really make a good enough replica. And he was completely upfront about it and gave me my money back. And that's absolutely fine. I'd rather someone did that than, you know, kind of make a crap replica or whatever. Um, now, the reason they're so difficult is they're light. OK, so. Um, when you've got such a large blade like this, one of the reasons that the Dane axe is so nimble is that the blade is very thin. So these examples in the Museum of London, the blade around here is, generally speaking, really, really flat and thin. Obviously, they have to have a certain amount of meat, a certain amount of steel around the socket. But when you get into the blade, it essentially has lots of distal taper, so it becomes very, very thin around here. And actually, if we look at some of the examples in the Museum of London, they are so thin that when they've been in the ground and they've rusted, they've actually rusted through. And it's conspicuous that they have rusted through in the flat of the blade where they're thinnest. So think about it a bit like a fuller in a sword blade. It's essentially a hollowed out region of the weapon where you don't need it to be thick because you've got a broad blade there. You've got a nice amount of width. It doesn't need to be th thick and heavy. And they obviously valued speed and lightness over hitting power. If you made it thicker, like a poleaxe, um, then indeed it would probably hit harder, but it wouldn't cut as well. And bear in mind that a lot of the opponents of the people using these axes, um, some of them would have had male shirts, hauberks, uh, hauberkians, um, and some of them wouldn't. Some of them wouldn't have had any armour at all. So, um, and even if someone was wearing a male shirt, if you were using one of these big two-handed axes, it's quite possible you would have aimed at their face, at their legs, at their arms, at all the bits that basically weren't covered with bits of, um, bits of mail. Um, so they seem to have prior prioritised a long cutting edge and a large head over a concentration of mass. OK, uh, but the other thing I'd say as well is if you want a cutting edge of a certain length, if you made it really, really huge, it would just be really, really heavy and cumbersome. Um, pole axes have relatively small heads, but they are tend to be quite thick. But there is one final detail of these axes in the Museum of London, which I think is really, really interesting. And that is that whilst the blade is really, really thin, very often they get thicker just before the edge. So I just put down this um, this one for a second. So if you imagine you've got the socket here, okay, and the socket goes down to being really, really thin blades. You've got a thin sheet, um, a, a, you know, a few millimeters, what probably about three three millimeters thick um, of the main blade. But then when you get to the edge, if you kept it that thin, you would end up. If this was really wafer thin, you would end up with a very, very fragile edge here, generally speaking. But these axes, not all of them, but most of them, or let's say a lot of them, then start to get thicker again just before the edge, and then they have a bevel, okay? So thin, 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 thicken out, and then bevel for the edge. So what they've done is they've essentially created a diamond sectioned edge on the edge of a flat blade. And what is also conspicuous about this as well is that for the most part, we're probably looking at a low carbon steel blade here with a high carbon steel edge, diamond edge, forge welded on. This has many advantages. It means that you've got a shock absorbent body here. It's less likely to crack, less likely to snap, break because it's softer. Um, and then you've got a very hard edge, which you can heat treat and essentially edge quench like you would do with a Japanese sword or something like that, or even some toolbars. So you have a very hard edge with a softer back. Brilliant! It means you can really concentrate on having a soft, almost brittle edge bound to a softer shock absorbing back. But not only that, it's economical because it means your best steel, which is very expensive, is retained only for the edge and not wasted where you don't need it, frankly. Um, 
Now what is interesting, and again we come back to why this assemblage in the Museum of London is so important and so interesting, is that not all of the axe blades are the same. So for a start, the examples in the uh, Museum of London vary um, through three basic ways. Number one, they vary in their shape and size. Okay, um, So that's a fairly simple way to vary. Secondly, they vary slightly in their sockets. All of their sockets are slightly different from each other and at least one of them, and I think perhaps two, have brass kind of sleeves that go inside the iron socket. But the third way is how they vary on the edge. And what's interesting is if you look across not just the Museum of London ones, but if you look across all of the ones surviving from all over Europe, not all of them have this reinforced diamond section edge. Some of them do indeed just go down to a thin edge. So what we're looking at here is some, is it personal preference or different types of axe for different types of target? We don't really know. Um, and just the same as you get different types of swords for different contexts for different environments for fighting different types of opponent. The sword you'd pick for fighting in armour, plate armour, is very different to the type of sword you'd pick for fighting in North Africa against lightly armoured opponents. Um, so, uh, and equally in periods it changes. So period it changes, area it changes, and yet within the same period in the same part of Europe we find two, uh, you could say roughly, two types of these large Dane acts. Some have reinforced edges and some don't. Anyway, to finish up there, really to say that I think these two-handed axes are uh, fascinating weapons. They did continue on into two-handed axes later. They didn't just disappear after the Battle of Hastings. Uh, two-handed axes that are clearly an evolution or a continuation of these two-handed axes did continue well into the 13th, you could even say the 14th century. You could even say that later 15th century types of axe are ultimately evolved from them but definitely things that were relatively similar to Danish axes or housecarl axes continued into the 12th, 13th century. Um, and they're very particular design, very specialized, very skillfully made. And if anybody out there is watching this video or you know someone who would like to watch this video who thinks that you might like to have a go at trying to reconstruct, I'm specifically looking for a replica of one of the Museum of London axes for which I can get measurements. And it must have a very thin, uh, distally tapered body and then a reinforced edge at the front um, where it so it thickens up slightly before it comes to a sharp edge and I'm very interested in trying to get one of these reconstructed so that I can use it for test cutting and um, just as a nice thing to have and so I can make more videos about them as well but anyway I hope this has been somewhat interesting and I will see you for the next video cheers folks thanks for watching please subscribe we have extra videos on patreon and you can follow us on facebook